And with that, let me just tell you a little bit about our speakers today. Um, John Guy is the cura curator cura <laughs> of South, a South and Southeast Asian art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, with research interests in the temple arts of the Hindu, Buddhist, Jain traditions, and in the ceramic and textile trade of the Indian diaspora. His recent major exhibitions include Interwoven Global in uh, 2013 and Lost Kingdoms, Hindu Buddhist Sculpture of Early Southeast Asia in 2014. He joined the Met's Asian Department in uh, 2008, after 22 years at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, where he was senior curator of Indian art with responsibility for the sculpture collections. He is an elected, he is an elected uh, member of a fellow of the London Society of Antiquaries and has acted as an advisor to UNESCO on historical sites in Southeast Asia and he's worked in partnership with government archaeological agencies in Thailand, Laos, and Vietnam. And he's done other stuff too, but I figured we didn't want to spend too much time going into all the things that he's, he's done. Um, most relevant for today's talk, he has recently curated an exhibit at the, museum, at the Met, um, Tree and Serpent, Early Buddhist Art in India, Early, early Buddhist Art in India, 20, 200 BCE to 400 CE. Uh, which opened on July 17th and runs through November 13th. So after you've heard the talk today, you should all run out uh, if you haven't already and go visit the exhibit more than once. So, um, and then as a um, respondent for today's talk, I'm pleased to introduce Tamara Sears. Um, Tamara is an associate professor of art history at Rutgers University. Her research focuses on the art and architectural history of South Asia, with a particular focus on the Indian subcontinent. Her first book, Worldly Gurus and Spiritual Kings, Architecture and Asceticism in Medieval India, published by Yale in uh, 2014, received the Prose Award in Architecture and Urban Plan. She's currently completing a second book that examines the relationships among architecture, environmental history, and travel on a local, regional, uh, and global scale. Uh, her essays have appeared in um, the Art Bulletin, Ars Orientalis, and Archives of Asian Art, and elsewhere. Um, she's also had her work supported by numerous grants and fellowships. Um, I also want to mention, I meant to say this in the beginning, uh, when I mentioned the events um, upcoming, Next week, we will have um, Suchera Mahajan, a historian from uh, JNU uh, in Delhi, speaking on revising history, um, revisioning the nation, erasures, distortions in history writing in India. So get that on your calendars as, as well. Um, same time, same place. So with that, please join me in welcoming John Guy. Thank you, Professor Ewing, and um, greetings, everybody. Um, what I thought I would do today um, is really uh, try and present some of the key ideas that uh, uh, informed the exhibition that I trust some of you at least have seen already, um, and join the crowd of those who have been back six times already. Uh, it's a show which is galvanizing a lot of interest. Um, uh, it's an attempt to re essentially rewrite the con received wisdom of the origins of the Buddha image as we uh, as conventionally present it. Um, and uh, to do that, I've shifted the paradigms in various ways, including a focus on lesser known material uh, coming from the Deccan. Um, this is partly because of the very simple criteria that I apply in all exhibitions that I'm out that the first uh, defining criteria of a work to be included is the ascetic standard that it needs to be drop-dead beautiful. Um, and once that's established, uh, then we move into our questions of historical importance, uh, iconographic interest, um, uh, and other sort of uh, sets of criteria. Um, and um, so 
the exhibition itself uh, has just stated over, I guess, a decade of um, thinking about this area of field work over four or five years in Andhra and Tanagana, Karnataka and elsewhere, um, uh, visiting the sites, uh, seeking out the go-downs and the storehouses of the small provincial museums, getting to know the corpus, um, and then through that, uh, building an understanding of what exactly was happening in the territories in the south, by which we were talking about the Satvahana, the Svaku, uh, territories uh, of the Deccan. So let me just uh, begin with a, a few prepared comments, and then I really want to take you through the substance of the exhibition. Can everyone hear? Okay, that's adequate. Uh, I did a, a nearly two hour Zoom this morning with Bihar Museum, um, so um, I'm a little bit hoarse already. <laughs> Bihar Museum has just been celebrating its um, um, uh, uh, centenary, I think it is. <clears throat> Buddhist art history has traditionally been built on a linear study that traces its development from Mathura, the city of the gods, to Gandhara in the northwest, east to Sarnath, um, and then having developed a pan uh, Gupta style of inspiring the artists of East, uh, South Bihar and Bengal uh, for the last flourish in medieval uh, India, traveling uh, beyond that across Asia uh, as its lasting legacy. Another perspective is presented here, shifting the paradigm away from the legacy of Greater Magadha in North India, where the Buddha, historical Buddha, uh, was born, taught, and died, uh, to the land south, the Dakshinapata. Uh, where his teaching spread and flourished in the early centuries BCE uh, into the uh, mid-first millennium common era. This, shift fo this focus shifts us away from the Kushanas and the conventional histories of, of linking Buddhism to the destiny, the rise and destiny um, uh, of the Kushanas as the great uh, flowering of Buddhist art, uh, shifts the focus to the Satavahanas and Isvaku dynasties uh, who ruled successively across the Deccan from the first century BCE through to around the early fourth, fourth century common era. Embedded in this realignment is a closer examination of the pre-Buddhist origins of Buddhist imagery. The emergence of the Buddha image in the religious landscape of early India drew on deeply rooted traditions of image making that are the oldest known in the subcontinent, and of course are non-Buddhist. The cult of nature deities, the trees and snake spirits, of yakshas, yakshis, nagas, naginis, played a central role in the beginnings of the figurative sculptural tradition and continue to do so long after the appearance of the fully realized Buddha, iconic Buddha image. Elements of these traditions persist in the visual repertoire of devotional imagery in India down to the present day. Why, might you ask, oh, did we shift the focus to the south, in both the exhibition and in, in the publication? Um, Southern India, of course, um, I've been asked this question many times by Indian journalists um, covering the um, Indian release of the, of the publication. Um, why the South? Why shift away from that comfortable home territory of the Gangetic regions and the Northwest? But if you step back and look at the key monuments of early Buddhism as they've come down to us, they're all in the Deccan. You're looking at, at Babud, you're looking at Sanchi, you're looking at Ajanta and early Amaravati. These are the monumental remains of early Buddhism. You do not witness anything remotely approaching the, the quality and in sheer investment uh, that in, uh, in terms of what survives, I therefore qualify what I'm saying, um, uh, in the north. Um, there are historical reasons for that, of course. But the fact remains, uh, the southern legacy is a remarkable one, and one which conventionally is treated as a footnote. Uh, the Satavahanas are always a footnote to the Kushanas. Uh, the art that's being produced in the south is uh, essentially marginalized. But what you'll see in the exhibition, I'll be so bold as to say, uh, a whole series of works of art that deserve to enter the canon of great Buddhist art globally. Um, and these works are barely known, barely published, don't claim they're unpublished, but, but many have featured, yes, they've been at a uh, a two-line entry in a 1956 Department of Archaeology report uh, when they were first removed from the stupa site at, at Dulikata or Dupadu or Chandavaram, wherever it might be, but have not been substantively published. Uh, they are now for the first time in the, the catalogue. If you look at the enclosure railings of Adhikar at Bhavad, uh, the, the ceremonial gateways of Tiranas at Sanchi, 
um, and the early phase railing copings uh, at Amaravati. These are the finest of their kind uh, in the early Buddhist world. They're rich in visual narrative, using their services as a tableau for the storytelling that makes Buddhist, Buddhism accessible and meaningful to wider communities. Translating thought into visuality was the task of stonemasons under the direction of learned monks, well versed in the efficacious narratives that are witnessed in the stupa decor from the second century BC onwards. We open in the first room uh, with an extraordinary um, gateway pillar from Palmi, a, a site which has barely been excavated because it has a, a modern temple on the, built over it, uh, therefore it's, uh, uh, it's, it's a no-go no zone in terms of archaeology, but they have recovered a few pieces in the 1970s, including one which is, you'll see in the first room, um, which is an extraordinary uh, indication of the, uh, the confidence of the artists producing great uh, narrative art at this early time. Our understanding of historical Buddhism, especially monastic Buddhism as practiced in early India, has largely been shaped by the interpretation of text generated by textual scholars, relying on the authority of sources often far removed in space and time from the events they recount. They traditionally paid, and no offense intended to anyone in the audience here, traditionally paid scant attention to the reality of early Buddhism as practiced on the ground. This be witnessed through two sources, and has already been done so. Uh, each, is, uh, each of which bring us closer to the realities of early lived Buddhism. Epigraphy, of course, is the first, which principally consists of donative inscriptions uh, <coughs> found in monastic settings, and secondly, the archaeology of Buddhist monasticism. The latter has been skewed in favor of stupa archaeology, with insufficient attention being paid to the developing an understanding of the wider monastic complex and the broader cultural landscape. Mm -hmm. Yet it is to the archaeological landscape of early Buddhism that we must look, including ongoing excavations and an expanding corpus of inscriptions that gives flesh and blood to our understanding of Buddhism as lived in the first millennium. Buddhism in southern India cannot boast a single site uh, visited by Sakyamuni Buddha in his lifetime. Yet within a period of less than a hundred years after his death, Buddhism had penetrated south into Dakshinapata, uh, especially into uh, the regions of Andhra, the great centers uh, bracketed by the Krishna and the Godavari rivers, um, uh, for various uh, reasons largely to do with uh, commerce. Andhra Desa, as the region was called at the time, claimed the possession of true relics uh, housed in funerary mounds and stupas um, uh, from the very beginnings of, of, of the dissemination of Buddhism uh, beyond uh, uh, soon after his lifetime. Although the Buddha didn't travel, his relics certainly did. Um, and um, the division of relics, of course, the most celebrated with Akhambar Ashok, uh, but uh, uh, part of a wider practice of subdivision and distribution of relics to empower new areas, uh, endorse, uh, endorse them with the construction of new monasteries and and stupas uh, ensured uh, the prototyping and spread of Buddhism right across the Deccan um, within a relatively short period of time. This remarkable Buddhist transformation of the southern lands was the product of two powerful forces. Obviously the appeal and authority of the Buddha's message, and the, but also the patronage of an increasingly wealthy mercantile and artisan class uh, who sustained the faith and furthered its propagation. In so doing, they were venturing deep into territories that belonged to other gods, where nature spirits and de demigods presided. It was a contested religious landscape, and the early Buddhists had to compete for spiritual allegiance. One has to ask uh, when the landscape into which the Buddha himself was born, when he chose, a, we're told, age 26, to cast aside his princely status and uh, become a a wisdom seeker, um, a mendicant, um, uh, that landscape, of course, was populated by nature deities of various forms, um, and malevolent often. Um, and uh, we have the sculptural record of that, of course. Um, and um, much of the history of Buddhism and much of the teachings of the Buddha as preserved in, in, in the sutras, but also uh, in other, various other narrative forms, uh, make clear that the Buddha set about 
uh, taming and accommodating, winning over these forces. And so Hariti, the devourer of infants, bringer of infant mortality, in other words, um, uh, become, becomes the maternal protector of children, and so on. This process transformation of the elements in the landscape, uh, the Naga, of course, the, mo the most dangerous uh, creature on the landscape, uh, particularly for children in the rainy season, is the snake. Um, so, of accommodating the Nagas uh, and bringing them into your into your fold uh, as it became a, a, a key uh, strategy pursued by the Buddha. And this is very clearly witnessed uh, in the art, in the visual record, in the visual evidence, in a way that it's not so clearly evidenced in other sources of evidence. Uh, the region, Dakshina Pata, the roads leading south, the region south, Dakshina Dakan, of course, um, the, the, the regions uh, south of the, um, the India range, which really is the historical divide of north and south, uh, northern India and southern India, um, and then the river systems which flow, oh, thank you, thanks, Bill. The river systems that flow uh, west to the uh, Arabian Sea and east to the Bay of Bengal. Um, this defines the territory of the Deccan, and, uh, and it, it's the great uh, history that embodies, uh, in, so integral to the uh, ex early expansion, or expansion of Indian Buddhism. Uh, and you only need to look at the number of sites. And in the exhibition, the site map we produced in the introductory section, uh, in which we only show the let me show the, the most important sites because the map was getting so overcrowded. Yeah. Uh, gives you a sense uh, of, of the extent to which uh, Buddhist patronage was an enormous economic engine uh, in the region at this time. In the, in the catalog um, the publication, the book, the 344 page book that I forgot to bring today uh, to, to present to the department, clever me, um, uh, we have a gazetteer of uh, um, Southern uh, Buddhist sites associated, Buddhist sites associated with, associated with the Deccan, um, a, a, a project lovingly worked on by an army of interns over several years, um, and uh, in a gazetteer of sites, um, it runs to about 20 pages, uh, and each is a, a relatively short paragraph entry. You get a sense of just how many sites there are, how important they are. Our knowledge of them in many cases is extremely flawed and incomplete, the sites themselves, in some cases, almost entirely disappeared. Um, uh, a small amount of bricks on the landscape. Um, their reliquaries uh, pillaged centuries ago, um, and um, after very little to remain. Others are far more spectacular, uh, but uh, great sculptures have been retrieved from many of these sites. Tree and serpent. I, I, I just I have to acknowledge James Ferguson, 1873. Um, James Ferguson's Tree and Serpent: Mythology and Art. Uh, the topes of Sanchi and Amaravati. Uh, I, I, yes, I shamelessly stole his title. I, what I in fact did was acknowledged his title, acknowledged the pioneering work that Ferguson did, uh, building on the work of another, a whole generation of, of field archaeologists before him. Uh, Ferguson was a great synthesizer, really. He wasn't a cutting edge archaeologist. Uh, but nonetheless, he provided an enormously valuable service. Um, and then to distance myself from what uh, that, that earlier scholarship in terms of the way in which we can revisit this subject. And uh, the, uh, that's best understood by walking the exhibition. Um, the forms of the stupas as they're preserved, this is Sanchi II, um, uh, very early, the site uh, um, certainly is such, um, generated in its earlier iteration with the visit of Emperor Ashoka. Um, and then, uh, like all stupas, subject to repeated renovation and expansion um, uh, over time. Uh, the railings are amongst the earliest sculptural programs that we have. We don't know what the very earliest stupas look like. The panel on the top, the uh, uh, crossbar on the top, gives us a clue. Uh, almost the, the Tower of Babel stepped pyramid type with multiple uh, production of uh, at, 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 at several levels. And looking again at the remains of Chandavaram, photographed here from the 1970s before it was um, uh, uh, done over with a manicuring veneer of bricks, 
uh, uh, you get a sense that yes, we're looking here at a stupa with uh, several uh, circumambulation pathways, ground level, but upper terrace ones as well, uh, very much resembling what we see uh, in this very early uh, uh, lintel from uh, Zanon. The distribution of relics necessitates reliquies, of course, um, and uh, it's uh, striking the extent to which there is a pan-Indian culture prevailing in terms of reliquies at this time. The forms, the materials were used, uh, the use of uh, lathe-turned uh, soapstones uh, principally, um, and for the, the rarest and most special ones, uh, rock crystal. Um, and the display you see here on the screen that uh, is from um, Petropoli, uh, uh, with its rock crystal uh, reliquies at the bottom and the assorted uh, op uh, uh, relic uh, offerings that were made by, by devotees. And I show alongside on the lower right uh, the five relic containers that were recovered uh, in 1898 from Kibraha, the sites on Tweten, 12 miles south of Lombini uh, in northern UP. Uh, the significance of that location is not lost on you, I'm sure. Um, and Kibraha produced the single most important uh, discovery of Buddhist reliquary remains uh, in India at that point, including one of the reliquaries, this one, which carries a Brahmi inscription indicating that it contained the corporeal remains of Sakyamuni Buddha. Um, and the context of, of the, the location, the context, the nature of the bricks and the structure in which they were embedded, all points uh, adds credibility to this being a, a, a reasonable and genuine claim. Um, yeah, that's a long haul story. I won't spend 30 minutes telling you the, the detail of that. Um, but it's, it's, I do discuss it in the, in the publication. Um, relic, reliquies play a very special role. I mean, it, it's not necessary. And one always thinks, you know, relic, that you have one Buddha relic at each stupa, but of course it's not the case. Uh, multiple uh, relics were, uh, uh, and, and, it, and the, the relic chain was reopened and reconsecrated through time. Um, and so the nature of the deposits, so each of you, uh, in the room would want to make a, an offering to earn merit for you and your family. So you would also go and buy a gemstone or a pearl um, from the merchant around the corner and, and make your offering. So in the Prabhupada uh, deposit, there were something like 1,600 tiny little uh, offerings contained in five relic containers, all within a large mm -hmm. stone coffer. We have roughly 200 of those in the exhibition. Um, uh, the, the balance is in the museum, Kolkata. Uh, lives in the safe in the museum. I've seen the safe. I've not seen the contents. Uh, it's guarded by Nagas. Uh, <laughs> you, don't, you don't get near it. Uh, uh, never displayed. Uh, for, secu for security reasons, of course. Uh, so, uh, Amaravati. Uh, and uh, these are the little, rather rough cut, uh, rock crystal reliquies that were discovered uh, quite relatively recently, 1980s, I think. Um, and three of them, were th there were three set into stone recesses on a recycled, uh, 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 it was a recycled part of a railing. Um, and they'd made these little ca cavities um, um, and must have had a stone plug on the top, which is now lost. Uh, the reliquies are in the site museum. Uh, but this redeposit and, uh, uh, and of reliquies is a very important aspect of it. We always think of relics as being understood, concealed, never seen uh, within the heart, the masonry heart of the stupa. But of course, the, uh, those practices also uh, uh, changed, and we know that relics were also paraded, brought out on festivals, and so on. We'll come to that uh, in a moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, excavation at Nabajunaconda. On the right, this base of a monumental Buddha in which were recovered, uh, set within the base between the feet, uh, a gold container with little um, um, golden pearl uh, offerings. Uh, so the image itself being the vehicle for relics, for relic offerings. Um, Sopara, uh, uh, on the west coast, a uh, little north of uh, Mumbai, uh, produced a, a very important uh, uh, deposit in the late 19th century, um, and uh, which we had an earthen container which, in, within which there was a bronze 
uh, with, with, within which uh, there was a gold uh, uh, and a rock crystal, uh, so Russia doll-like uh, construction, um, and with the this very distinctive three-legged pattern, uh, which uh, of course has ancient uh, tricol uh, device, uh, which we see uh, decorating the gold punch gold work here. Um, um, coming undoubtedly from the West Asian, uh, ultimately Greek world, um, and uh, the, this early panel, which now lives in storage at Amaravati, first phase, probably first century BCE, um, uh, in which we have that same pattern being celebrated uh, in the, the, uh, uh, the dome, dome uh, section of the stupa at Amaravati. In the exhibition, we have two of the reliquies from uh, the Sanchi area, excavated by Cunningham and Macy. Um, uh, the two stone ones, the rock crystal was too fragile to travel, but I leave it in for good measure. Uh, uh, each of these, uh, many of these carry inscriptions, the one on the, on the, on the left, naming uh, lineage figures, major figures in, in the early Buddhist lineage, um, uh, whose, whose remains were, were uh, preserved in them. Um, and. Um, so we show these uh, alongside, uh, these are from uh, Sonari and uh, Bojpur, uh, the satellite sites around the greater uh, Sanchi region. The display of relics uh, is uh, witnessed, you only just have to look, the evidence is staring at us. Uh, we see it in Ganhara, open display of relic containers during festivals. We have Farsian's description in the early 5th century and so on. The, temp uh, the, the tooth relic in Sri Lanka celebrated every year in our time, um, paraded on elephants, of course, been happening since the 4th century when the tooth relic found its way was sent as a uh, royal gift to Sri Lanka. Here we have it from Dupadu, uh, remarkable, uh, beautiful, uh, two spectacular panels uh, from this uh, site, uh, not so far from Chandavaram, almost certainly shared the same school of sculptors, workshop practice, and so on. Uh, this strong style is things between the two regions. And here you see the display of the relics, uh, very, very much in evidence. The choice of subject matter varies. There's no consistency in this. So uh, here we have three, three moments in the life of the Buddha represented. The, the awakening, the, the wisdom tree, the Bodhi tree, uh, Bodhgaya, uh, the wheel, the teachings, uh, presumably referencing um, the, the first sermon at Sana, although we don't have the deer in this instance, but uh, uh, referring to the Dharma, and of course the uh, uh, Mahaparanibbana uh, with the, the relics uh, alluding to his passing. So they've chosen those three particular moments uh, to represent uh, on the uh, facade of the uh, Ayaka platform with, with the great Ayaka pillars uh, rising above. And then, of course, the interlocked, um, intertwined bodies of the protective snakes, um, which are always uh, a feature of, 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 of imagery in the south. Huh. And that has a very, that has very, there's a detail uh, of, of that uh, wonderful work. Sanchi, um, and as in uh, Dean Lal's photograph from the 1880s, um, uh, a figure up on the first terrace to give you a sense of scale. Um, and um, one particular find I was very pleased about uh, this set of drawings uh, associated with uh, the Tiranas at Sanchi. Uh, these are draw original drawings produced by Frederick Macy uh, in the winter of 1851 at Sanchi, he was sent by the, the uh, company uh, to document uh, Sanchi, was, of course, immediately pre-photography. All his labors became redundant within a, a decade when the camera <laughs> arrived. But nonetheless, he produced these uh, detailed uh, drawings, records of the sculptural programs on, 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 on the great gateways uh, at, at, at Sanchi Stupa number one. The bulk of these drawings sit at the British Library. Uh, this group, uh, well, it used to be on loan to the V&A, and I went searching for it, and they said, no, 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 no. The great lady, the, the lady passed away, someone I'd written to and never got an answer, uh, 30 years ago, uh, and uh, the family come and came and claimed them back. Um, so uh, I was able to eventually track them down, um, and uh, uh, they've come on loan to the exhibition, but mm -hmm. still retained by the, by the direct descendants of Macy. 
have any courage, and that I should uh, make good <coughs> plans in place. So these works, of course, they find their way to the British Library at some point before mm -hmm. some avaricious American museum tries to buy them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the collection and display of this material, um, I just give you a glimpse of the store, store go-downs of Amaravati uh, from the 1920s, uh, uh, which, uh, collecting of, of what material survived at the site. Of course, Amaravati has a, a somewhat tragic history of uh, uh, ill-advised interventions by amateurs and uh, uh, Others who imagine they, they uh, uh, were following good archaeological practice, um, but so the site has suffered grievously. But having said that, many other sites have suffered for other reasons, other depredations uh, of the local communities who uh, saw stupa sites as a ready source of building bricks um, and uh, limestone panels, which burnt down very nicely uh, to produce lime. So uh, there, there was, there was yeah. much was lost. Uh, through uh, ill-informed Ill, Ill action. The sites themselves. So this is Nagarjuna Konda, as you will not see it today because it's under Nagarjuna Sagawa Reservoir. Um, uh, this is a photograph from the 1930 campaign uh, uh, under Longhurst, uh, in which you see a, a number of the monastic sites uh, in the Great Valley. This, of course, was the ancestor was the royal capital of, of the Esparkas. This is Vijapuri, uh, as recorded in the inscriptions. And there's a, a major uh, documentation project underway that many of you will be aware of, being led by Arlo Griffiths and Vincent Tonnier uh, to revisit the whole corpus of uh, uh, Andhra inscriptions uh, and uh, re revisit, reread, uh, and uh, in some cases find new ones and add to the corpus. Uh, and that project is uh, uh, reaching fruition um, and is already partially online. Generated out of the AFAO in Paris. One of the catalysts for this exhibition were two new sites uh, which were producing uh, extraordinary material. One is Panagiri, uh, uh, not far from Hyderabad in Telangana. The other is Kandalahali. Uh, Panagiri, uh, uh, is a, a lovely site. Um, the, the rocky outcrop in a lush uh, river valley, uh, cultivation of rice, uh, directly at the, at the base of the, of the mountain is a uh, very com comfortable village um, uh, and uh, agricultural community. The site itself is quite spectacular. You can see the scale and the uh, full elaboration of the monastic plan. Uh, that's visible mm -hmm. here with the stupa structure, with the uh, apsidal shrines, the assembly halls and viharas, um, and the monastic cell complexes and so on. Uh, it's really a very elaborate uh, complex and the archaeology is ongoing and it's not finished yet. Um, but major finds have nonetheless been made. Um, wonders of new technology. Uh, and you see very clearly the two uh, apsidal shrines here. Uh, the courtyard areas, uh, assembly halls, and so on. This site has yielded a, a, a range of very stunning sculptural elements, some of which are in the exhibition. You'll see those, or have seen already. Uh, it also has some very important inscriptions. Uh, this uh, pillar, uh, which you see here, and there's a detail of the inscription, um, uh, is, uh, records, identifies itself as uh, a Dharma Chakra Stamba, that is a pillar to support the display of a Dharma wheel, um, mm -hmm. the teachings of the Buddha, uh, uh, funded by a, the royal physician of the royal household, um, and the king is named, and so on. So uh, the regnal, uh, regnal years are given. Um, so uh, a very important uh, uh, discovery, and quite Separately, uh, this small element uh, found its way into one of the state archaeology museum go-downs in uh, Hyderabad, um, and it has to be uh, has to be part of the Dharma wheel itself. Um, uh, but so there might, there's more to find, obviously, uh, but a small fragment. Uh, and I show you the comparison with this very early representation uh, from uh, Sanchi to uh, the same treatment of the of the uh, border of the. Uh, 
decorative border of the, of the wheel. Uh, and we know these were, were open spoked wheels. We have the stone example uh, in the Amaravati Museum. The Panagiri site uh, produced an amazing discovery in 2002 when uh, the excavators uh, uh, going down to a depth of about two meters uh, found a whole cache of sculptures from the site which had clearly been placed there for safekeeping, for preservation, out of respect, whatever reason, uh, we assume at the point at which the monastery was no longer sustainable. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the monastics would have been obliged to abandon the stupa. The community was no longer supporting them, feeding them, um, and uh, the people had turned away uh, for other reasons. Uh, and laid out in this uh, lower courtyard were uh, these spectacular elements of the largest re recorded Tirana uh, found outside Sanchi uh, in the south. Here's one of the crossbars that's in the exhibition. Another crossbar that's also in the exhibition. Uh, these items have not been shown anywhere before, not shown in India before. They came straight from the go down to the exhibition. Uh, and a whole series of other items that we uh, uh, considered bringing. But, uh, budgets uh, got well, in the way of that. Mm -hmm. So there they are uh, mm -hmm. in the exhibition. Mm -hmm. uh, together with the piece in the foreground, uh, from almost certainly, uh, um, I think from Kasenapali, another, another important site uh, which is not yet properly uh, excavated, uh, but a chance find in the 1970s, ended up in Gunter, the uh, museum in Gunter. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, these therefore represent the two only two documented Tiranas we have uh, from the Deccan, from the Satavahana territories, excluding Sanji itself. So this is a very, very important uh, new additions to, to the corpus and to our understanding of the scale and majesty and commercial investment that went into monastic Buddhism at this time. By this time, I mean probably at the close of the third century, just for the fourth century around that mark. The other great site is uh, Kanaganahali. Uh, this is the greatest Sanity area that uh, is what's so well known. Uh, this is really a part of the broader Sanity complex uh, in northern Karnataka, near Gorbalga. Uh, a large, uh, beautiful uh, stupa, uh, which almost certainly uh, collapsed through poor engineering. Uh, the slabs appear to have collapsed outwards uh, onto their faces. Um, and that, of course, has ensured their remarkable preservation including traces of original polychrome and pigment, um, uh, which uh, almost never survives, of course. Uh, so it, it becomes a very important site. Uh, the protective naga, of course, at the, uh, the, the gate, the moonstone in the foreground, uh, sections of the enclosure railing, and so on. Um, these spectacular uh, uh, Naga figures, uh, this is one of the great ones um, from uh, Kulidata, uh, Durdikata um, in uh, near Karim Nagar, um, in which we see the, uh, the honorific umbrella, the, the wisdom tree, the Bodhi tree, uh, uh, and the wondrous uh, Naga with his uh, jewel, th uh, throat jewel, uh, uh, protecting the throne uh, and uh, Buddha Pada beneath. And uh, it's a magnificent, magnificent image. Um, and the inscription tells us that it was donated by the mother uh, of a Gahapati, of a man of property, however we choose to define that term, um, contentious. But certainly a, a, a man of means, uh, and um, uh, with the wealth uh, and the family, uh, the, the mother did the spending. Mm -hmm. Two panels from um, um, uh, this is extraordinary, extraordinary site, Kanaganahali, um, in which we see uh, the depictions uh, of the empty throne being venerated. In this particular instance, um, I labored for some time over the issue of this detail because it's clearly a, a referencing a rock formation, mountainous locations, um, and uh, we, uh, you can read the entry, but uh, 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 it's a very precise uh, location that ties it right back. Uh, to the 
the Borough Archive complex, um, which of course enjoyed Moyan a patronage uh, under Ashoka and under his father. And uh, an image of, uh, you can guess, handsome Nanda, the Nanda story, um, uh, uh, the brother of the brother of the, of the, of the Buddha, uh, represented here uh, um, the, day, the day of his wedding. That mm -hmm. about to be frustrated by his brother. One of the things we try to do in the exhibition is introduce some sense of what lived Buddhism must have been like. That's, we're getting into wild, speculative territory here. Um, but uh, the use of aromatics, uh, the, the production of music, all of which we, we can witness in, in the visual record, is, is there, it's staring at us in the face. Uh, we want to pay attention to it. Uh, and so th these, um, one of the things I did in the exhibition is sought the blessing of a Sri Lankan Sangha here in New York. That's a Colombo order, and they have a branch in Queens, would you believe, um, serving the Sri Lankan community there. Um, they blessed the exhibition, and we, re with, we recorded them with their permission. The, the chanting of the sutras uh, is, is piped into the space where the relics are displayed. Um, and um, uh, it's an evocation, I think, of the atmosphere of worship and veneration. Um, uh, in a fairly unbroken line. The tradition represented by the Sri Lankan order, of course, uh, comes directly out of the Andhra territories. I don't think it's a King James edited edition. I think this is pretty pure. Uh, and so what we're getting, I think, is something very close uh, to what must have been, uh, uh, been produced uh, in ancient Andhra times. This landscape that the Buddha encountered, of course, was full of images like this of Nagas, Nagarajas, uh, who lived in water, watery places. Um, just as the Nagas protected the Buddha in his lifetime, um, Mukalinda is the most famous example of that. Uh, they were, became the self-appointed guardians of his relics after he died. Uh, Ramagrama, the eighth, where the eighth portion of the relics were placed, is the most famous case. And when you see the Nagas entwined around the stupa, first thought it's the Ramagrama stupa, uh, guarded by the Nagas, uh, but it becomes more generic as well, um, and it's really a signature uh, of Southern Buddhism, which is why I found its way into the, the title of the exhibition. Water imagery, very, very important. Um, uh, uh, from Ordor, um, um, if the beginning of life in, in, uh, in the Vedas is sound, then I'd say it's also water. <laughs> Um, it, it's uh, uh, foundational, uh, we see it all the time, and the first two rooms of the exhibition are full of objects like this, wondrous objects, uh, which, which we see these uh, yaksha figures, these uh, sonified, uh, self-manifest uh, creatures, uh, demigods, if you like, uh, with vines, lotus vine growing out of their mouth, uh, the very source of life itself. Mm. Uh, Again, repeated here, uh, it's a small step from the, the water uh, imagery to the image of Sri and Lakshmi, Lakshmi. And then, of course, even from Kasambi, uh, at the very beginnings of, of Kasambi's uh, great sculptural record from around the second century BC, around the same time that you get the Udaigiri caves in Orissa, we have representations of Gajra Lakshmi. She's there very, very early. She's also in the Western Ghats at this early moment. Uh, and here she is being uh, illustrated by uh, two uh, cheerful looking elephants raised up on lotus. Uh, so they're celestial, uh, airborne uh, 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 creatures. So the association um, uh, between um, the goddess and water is very, very strong. Uh, think of all the divinities in India that are lotus form. The divinity is indicated by their presence on pl a plant form as if grow, that is their primordial source. And of course, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to, to look at the Gajya Lakshmi image and just read it as a metaphor for the monsoon. Good idea, the goddess here, the Sri form, literally of the plant life itself, you know, growing from the, these great forms. Uh, and so water plays a very important part in the life of the Buddha too. From the, his, his first bath when he's born, this uh, very rare sculpture from Matara, in which we see the two great Nagas, 
Nanda and Upananda uh, bathing the infant, uh, one with warm water, we're told, one with cold water um, from their respective wells uh, or sources of water and celestial instruments represented in the heavens. Mm -hmm. No players, but just celestial music. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful and evocative image. And of course, it carries over into the, a broader cultural context. This is essentially Abhishek in various forms of, lust, of lustration, um, uh, particularly for the consecration and reconsecration of, of rulers, uh, becomes a very important subject. Uh, it's very rarely represented in Indian art. I have to show you a 7th century uh, a pre Angkorian Cambodian example uh, to illustrate uh, a, con a consecration ceremony performed by Brahmins. Um, uh, uh, in, uh, in Cambodia this time. At Kanagandahali, uh, we see water being used, uh, being poured from pitchers into the hands of monks here, into the hand of another princely figure here. This is uh, both associated with water, uh, pouring of water for the uh, sealing of the contract, uh, closing the deal, essentially. So in this case, this is a scene in which the, the, uh, the inscription tells us, records the surrender of the city of Ujjain, uh, a peaceful transfer of power, we're led to believe, uh, between, I think, cousins or certainly related uh, noblemen, um, uh, but a forced sale nonetheless, uh, and being sealed by the pouring from the pitcher into the hand. And here, uh, a named uh, king of the Satavahana household, uh, gifting to two monks, uh, a dish uh, being held up by a, a small female figure, and the inscription tells us uh, it's gifting silver lotus flowers. Uh, and this is uh, clearly described in the inscription. Mm -hmm. Probably intent was probably a much larger gift, but they symbolized uh, the endowment of the king to the site. Uh, and the deal uh, sealed by pouring uh, water over the hands of the two monks who received the gift on behalf of the Mahachapya. The gift, the gift was to the, the stupa itself as a legal entity. Mm. We see it repeatedly. These are uh, uh, works on the right. It's from you know, uh, uh, Chand Chandavaram, uh, and another related piece in which pictures are being used to water the base of the tree mm. here um, by devotees. Um, and uh, of course, we're reminded of the power of nature deities when Queen Maya, having just delivered uh, the, the infant Buddha to be, uh, immediately presents him to the family deity. And who was the family deity? A tree spirit, of course, uh, seen emerging from the trunk of the tree. Uh, and uh, he merges and reciprocates the gesture uh, uh, back uh, to, uh, uh, to the uh, infant Buddha to be. But you get a sense of uh, how uh, central these cults are uh, to the early Buddhist narrative. Uh, trees, of course, play a central role. Tree, trees with enclosures, of course, become tree shrines by definition. Uh, here it is, Dugagiri. Here is the greatest one from Besnagana, uh, the Disha territory, um, uh, spectacular, two meters high, monolithic, uh, in which you see the tree uh, uh, weighed down with sacks of money. These are pots and purses of punchmark coins. So uh, this is the, um, we're probably in the third century uh, BC, or certainly second, uh, and uh, quite spectacular, uh, embodying the wish-fulfilling tree, which clearly is a pre-Buddhist thing, but finds its way into the Buddhist language very, very quickly. And Nagarjuna Konda, some five or six centuries later, uh, we have a personification of that same idea. So this is the best Nagar uh, wish-fulfilling tree, and one of the details shows a conch from which emit uh, there's a great pile of square punch mark coins sitting in it. This is precisely uh, what this figure personifies uh, in human form uh, uh, 500 years later. The first pair of uh, these are the Nidhi, the, um, the Padma Didi and Shankar Nidhi. These are the sidekicks of Kavera. Um, they're the money men. Um, and there they are. We have one of them in the exhibition. Um, uh, from the Conda, and uh, from his lotus crown uh, um, here, sorry, the conch, conch crown here uh, emits the great flow of coins. 
these are the figures, the same figures that are described as being depicted in mural paintings by color dots around this a little bit later, in, within mm -hmm. 50, 50 years or 100 years of this sculpture, as appearing on in the interiors, flanking the doorways uh, in secular architecture and palaces. Veneration mm -hmm. of trees, of course, you all know is not new, it's there today, it's part of everyday life in India, continues to the present. And offerings to the stupas take many forms. Uh, this is an enclosure railing, very small scale, um, and uh, almost certainly for a tree shrine or for a, a very small uh, 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 chaptia. Uh, and um, uh, we see the examples uh, represented, probably something resembling that, and it's about five feet in section. Um, um, and this is one of the earliest pieces of graffiti that we have from Amaravati. Uh, the inscription can be read but cannot be understood uh, according to Oscar von Hindenburg. <coughs> no one has succeeded in extracting any meaning uh, from the cluster of, of letters. Uh, uh, and uh, the stupa, uh, garmented, festooned, uh, in, uh, fully decorated, and, and of course uh, the, the tree with, with great banners uh, flying from, from the upper branches. This is, becomes highly elaborated when you get uh, to Barhood and their representations of the Bodhi tree itself and what was almost certainly a wooden enclosure uh, such as the type that uh, Emperor, would have been there when Emperor Ashok uh, visited and uh, poured lustration over the roots of the tree. Um, here celebrating the Vajra Asana, the, the throne mark. The enclosure railings, we have the first ra enclosure railing from Bodhgaya replaced in the Gupta period, buried at Bodhgaya, excavated in the late 19th century. Uh, this is one of the original um, first uh, wooden rail, uh, stone railings. Uh, coming now to uh, the global situation of India in, this, in the context of the exhibition, I really wanted to celebrate uh, the international nature of Satavahana India, to, to really uh, promote that a little bit uh, in, in the face of this uh, great a focus on the Kushanas and the Northwest, uh, the Central Asian uh, connections, all of which are, are terribly important. But the international nature of Satavahana India, with its control of the West and East Coasts of India in the, uh, this time, uh, uh, points to a, a very dynamic uh, and wealth generating moment for India, uh, much of which uh, uh, supported Buddhism. Uh, this is the excavation of Brahmapuri. Uh, uh, modern-day Kolapur near Pune, uh, 1944, uh, of a merchant, what's thought to have been a merchant's house. Uh, the site has now, I think, got modern, nasty concrete buildings and can't be excavated any further. Uh, in the 1880s, the same site generated this group of bronze miniature objects, quite remarkable, also <coughs> disappeared without trace, uh, but they were pu uh, published uh, in the Bombay Asiatic Society. Uh, and uh, these no longer exist. So miniature Tiranas, miniature stupas, and so on. I just showed for comparison a fragmentary piece in the Viennese collection, um, and um, uh, the, of course the famous Chaucer Ward uh, from uh, the Nowen Patna Museum. John, could you have maybe wrap up so that Tamara has time oh, to... Oh, sorry, to wind up. Yeah, yeah wind up, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so uh, just uh, the display of the... Uh, uh, finds from Ramapuri, the Satavahana, and Roman finds. And uh, these are the Satavahana material, which we'll see, but I want to particularly yeah. focus on um, the Poseidon figure, uh, which remarkable uh, find excavated, as I say, in West Coast India, uh, almost certainly Alexandrian production. Luxury trade uh, to India, was it part of the Yavana world, or was it a, a curiosity? We don't know its function. Um, uh, along sort of history, and uh, on the right, uh, the very famous uh, image of the Yakshi excavated at Pompeii, 379 MD, obviously, uh, uh, and we can be documented as coming from the Deccan. Mm. Um, an image of the uh, uh, goddess who's almost certain from a Roman villa in Sicily, almost certainly, I would argue, uh, is a personification of India. Mm. Um, uh, the story of Purna, the sandalwood trader, um, known to many of you, um, uh, Purna Avadana, um, 
uh, made his wealth as a connoisseur of sandalwood. Um, I mention that simply to introduce uh, this practice that we see in both these two Bahu panels, both of which have uh, uh, Panchagulika, the five finger mark, uh, here on the base and here on the dome, uh, uh, the application of sandalwood paste hand impressions on the body of the holy stupa itself as an act of veneration, perhaps uh, protection. Mm. Mm. And extraordinary gold jewelry, I won't take time to give the background to that. Um, Roman influences, um, the trade in ivory, of course, is a, a very important one, and that finds its way into Buddhist narrative as well, as we see here with the six tusk <laughs> elephant of Bodhisattva uh, uh, Jataka. And this, to, to conclude, uh, I uh, venture to uh, quote Fasian from around 400, his observations of a, a Buddhist festival at Pataliputra. He also recorded another one in Khotan, uh, in Central Asia, on his travels. Um, and the description he gives is remarkably detailed. You'll find it all in, um, in the published accounts. Um, and uh, you could, reading it, you could, of course, be looking at a contemporary South Indian festival today. Um, that's my photograph from 20 years ago, um, in which uh, uh, these ratas uh, carry the images of the Buddha, except today, of course, they're Hindu deities. Um, so the practices uh, are almost certainly, uh, the question breaks the question, when did, where did these practices begin? Um, and um, I would suggest that uh, we should look very seriously at Buddhist origins for much of this uh, mm -hmm. practice is preserved today in later southern India. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I thought. Would you like to? Oh, sure. I, 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 what, what, well, I was wondering. I, no, I guess you. I, I can see here. I'll, I'll I, get out of the way. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, let me just switch my glasses so I can't. There we go. Um, so I just I, I want to say that I I want to start by briefly commenting on the exhibition, and uh, I'll respond to some of, I was taking notes as you were speaking, but I also had prepared a few things um, based on my experience of seeing the show. Um, uh, and I wanted to congratulate uh, John on, on, and your various collaborators for this exhibition uh, for something you, uh, that is truly magnificent. I mean, you, you, you noted that you start with the notion of, of creating an exhibition that is drop dead beautiful, and that is absolutely <laughs> achieved in this exhibition. It's, it's gorgeous. Um, uh, the lighting is spectacular, enhances the experience. The objects are, are uh, incredible. Um, uh, but I, I, I particularly noted that lighting uh, really enhances the experience, not only moving through the galleries, but also <coughs> highlighting the prowess of the artists, which we saw in the details that you showed, the, um, the, the ways in which the volumes are carved out of the sculpture, the textures of the clothing feel very palpable. I mean, and that, that is really uh, very much enhanced by the, um, by, by the mode of display. Um, uh, I, I also wanted to make a few comments on, uh, I, I, I'm glad that you showed the Dean Dial photograph. That photograph, uh, um, for anyone who has not seen the exhibition, that is the opening photograph in the exhibition. It's the entryway. And one of the things I noted as I walked into the exhibition is that it was wonderfully scaled. Um, so that as you walk into the exhi exhibition, there's a way in which you're walking past the Torana is just over your head. So, uh, and I'm assuming that was an intentional decision to, to sort of, I so. <laughs> yeah, pardon, yeah, to produce um, a kind of architectural space. Um, so, I, 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 you know, there. If you haven't seen the exhibition yet, you absolutely should. But keep keep an eye and think about those those kinds of details. Um, the other thing that I appreciated was the heights, the varying heights of the objects, and we could see that in some of the exhibition mm -hmm. photographs that you showed. Um, uh, so that you do get, you know, that sense of the scale of the human body of how and how one would have seen, you know, Torana pieces are up above. Um, and that does matter for those of you who are, are not familiar with looking at Indian uh, sculpture. Mostly when we see sculptures in a museum, we're seeing, the, you know, it, within the context, context of a museum, they're framed as individual artworks, but they're really fragments of larger monuments. They're, uh, I often like to think of them as indexes of larger monuments. And I, um, and 
I think that you've captured that also by varying the heights of the objects and also grouping objects together from uh, from from the same monument. And that was what uh, I, you know, you didn't make a you didn't make a particular note of this in in the presentation today. But one of the things that is really remarkable um, about the exhibition is the bringing together of objects from so many different. You mentioned the bringing together of so many different museums in India, objects that have never been seen before in the United uh, anywhere, uh, including in India. Um, but one of the things I appreciated were objects that were that I had seen in Calcutta, in in the Delhi, in. Mm -hmm. In, uh, in London, um, in the United States, from the same monument brought together mm. in one place. So uh, as, you, as you walk through the exhibition, it's, it's worth taking particular note, especially of Amaravati, for example, where you've brought objects together from, from different museum collections um, and a place together. And there's something kind of wonderful about seeing, uh, about, and I'm sure that was not an easy task to accomplish. So I think uh, this is something that, uh, that, uh, that as an art historian, I can say bluntly, this is a this exhibition was a very hard thing to achieve. It, I'm sure it was, uh, um, and it's really, um, it's, it's worth seeing. So yeah, pieces from Barhut, um, from the National Museum Delhi, and from the Indian Museum in Kolkata, and the North and Simon Museum side by side. It's, it's, it's really tremendous. Um, I also appreciated the dialogue between these lesser known monuments that, are, that we've just been learning about through recent excavations with these older monuments that are deeply known through archaeological, through histories of archaeological exploration. And I also noticed, uh, and we got some sense of it from your presentation as well, the integration of objects produced um, uh, for documentary purposes um, uh, and, for, and so forth. Um, uh, the integration of those within the, the display of the exhibition. They're not separated out. Often what you have in an exhibition like this is a separate room which talks about colonial eras of discovery and exploration um, uh, as a way of critically interrogating colonial era projects. Um, I have mixed feelings. I, I mean, I think that you know we, we have been interrogating colonial era histories for a very long time. They're worth interrogating, especially for uh, understanding the ways in which, which those epistemologies carry over into the present day. Um, at the same time, I often, when I go back as a, as a historian and read archaeological reports, there's a lot of wonderful information embedded in those reports and embedded in that process of discovery. And I think there's a way in which the dialogue, the way in which you've integrated those changes. Uh, and I would love to ask you more about some of the decisions you made, for example, of uh, placing, um, for example, the oil painting, or the, the, the Griffiths um, copies of the Ajanta ceiling so prominently um, in, in the opening of the exhibition in dialogue with uh, sculptural pieces. I think it's very interesting, but I'm, I'm curious as to sort of the thought process that went beyond into those. So that's one set, set of uh, questions. And I, you, you, I mean, I really appreciated seeing the Frederick Charles Macy drawings, because I've actually been working on Macy a little bit myself. Um, uh, but. Uh, um, uh, and uh, of course, uh, I, you didn't mention this explicitly. But those those drawings were reused in, by Ferguson in his Tree and Serpent publications. They were they were uh, produced for the archaeological excavate the, the Cunningham publication on Sanji, but they were reused explicitly in that uh, publication. So I thought that was a wonderful um, uh, addition. Um, but again, having those in dialogue, just situated um, with, uh, and I think they're right next to the oil painting by Fulton of the Chaitya Hall and Carly, or there's somewhere near. So, so again, integrating those those works into the larger exhibition. Um, let's see. Uh, from your talk, I, I was your shift to South India. Um, I mean, I, I I really quite liked that. I liked the focus there because you do have this idea of moving away, as you noted, from the idea of a survey where where we move where chronology moves geographically, and instead what we have is chronology moving through a geography. Um, which I think is um, Im important, um, and it, but again, the question of uh, the inclusion of Sanchi and, and Sanchi's place in this larger story is something that again I, I, I'm wondering whether or not we can begin to resituate some of these central Indian sites. Sanchi's not technically the Deccan; it's on the edge of Malwa, but it's right along the trade routes that connect everything. It's 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 a crucial position on the Dakshinapatta, as, as you noted, uh, and so I'm almost wondering whether or not. 
uh, like we can begin to sort of think, rethink the status of, 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 of geography uh, um, in, in, in thinking through the ways in which monuments themselves were connected. Um, and certainly, uh, you noted this as well, I made a note of, um, about the moving away from the landscape of the Buddha's life and that problem that that creates in the Deccan, because um, you know, there always is an emphasis in early Buddhism in looking at the geography of places where the Buddha himself was physically present during his lifetime. And of course, in all of these places, you have uh, the problem of making the presence of the Buddha um, uh, of establishing the presence of the Buddha through entirely through imagery, through relics, um, uh, and through the production of monuments and sacred landscapes. And I think that the exhibition does evoke the ways in which that, that happens. Um, I want to keep an eye on the time. Yeah, uh, let's see. Um, I was wondering about the question of the image's reliquary. Um, what, do we know anything about the types of consecration rituals or, or, or uh, that might have been conducted in relationship to these images? Are there textual sources that we should relook at um, uh, in light of this new material, ev uh, evidence of material culture? What is the, uh, so that's one, one, one question I had. I also was very struck by um, moving with, by the celestial instruments that you showed. And it immediately made, sorry? the celestial instruments. Oh. And, and it immediately made me think of uh, the, the Jain image of Parshwanath uh, that's at the VNA yes, from sorry. Yaraspur, which I always think of as one of those rare occurrences of um, what I like to think of as onomatopoeia in Indian art. Uh, if, uh, for those of you who don't know this image, it's an image of Parshwanath seated with a Naga hood above him. And there's a, couple, a, dr a set of drums above on, uh, and with these disembodied hands playing the drums. Mm -hmm. And I always think of that as evoking. Mm -hmm. We think of it as a Gupta thing, but here it is much earlier. It yeah. apparently is. And, and in, in that case, I always think of that as evoking the sound of thunder, of the rain. Um, so as, as this, so the sound is not being necessarily just being the presence of music, but also evoking uh, the sounds of nature. So that um, so I was wondering whether you know how one might begin to reframe or think about the the role of music in in different ways in relationship also to to, to nature and natural landscape, um, and then uh, I, I I'm looking at the time and I am wondering if I should stop well, here. I mean, if you have things to say. Um, I mean, I I I, 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 I always do. I mean, certainly, <laughs> <laughs> but I also want you know want to take a couple more minutes and then okay us a chance to ask you. Yeah, no, I, I, th I think that, um, again, so, uh, um, yeah, so I got the, oh, one other note, um, I'm, I'm going, one other note, I think, that might be worth, if you go see the exhibition, um, uh, or if you haven't, in, uh, or go back to see it again, uh, it's worth looking again at the relics and the mode of display, and I wanted to ask you about some of the decisions about displaying, because I thought, I mean, it was beautifully done, um, and one of uh, one of the things I was very struck by was the, the choice of displaying the relics in such a way that you could see through it. Um, and I think we got a. Did you show an image here? I, I'm trying to remember of, of the display there, where you have uh, uh, there's a kind of glass panel, and you get a real sense for the. Yeah, that right there. Um, and uh, yes, that's for the for the materiality sure. of the relics. Okay. Relics, and I, I I took several photographs of that because sure. it was just so magnificent. Um, and Do you want I want me to comment on yes, on please. that aspect. And, yeah, um, please. Uh, so, um, I mean, I suppose the first thing to say that no single item is uh, uh, casually displayed. Uh, the placement is absolutely critical, um, and um, uh, the more you look, the more you'll uh, hopefully appreciate that. Uh, the brief that I gave to our designer, who I think is quite brilliant, um, was to make uh, the stupa the center of the story, the relics to be at the heart of the ex exhibition, uh, metaphorically and literally. And we created an 18 foot high drum, which you see, no you don't, you see, mm -hmm. and uh, a Vedica enclosure with the suggestion of the pillars uh, uh, on the interior, uh, rather sort of Brancusi-esque pared down versions. Um, as a visitor, you're obliged to, to walk the production of Pata, uh, whereupon you come to the space with the relics displayed within, which I know there shouldn't be a within with a stupa, but 
to allow some little artistic license. Uh, mm -hmm. But the, uh, the window uh, shows the Piperaho uh, relic offerings, um, and through that you get a direct sight line at a, um, a scaled model of a stupa, generic model mm -hmm. of a stupa, uh, produced by the good students of Cooper Union School of Architecture. Mm -hmm. um, and beautiful work. Um, and uh, as you come into that immersive space, uh, with the relics flanking you on three sides, um, you have the chanting of the monks. Right. Um, and uh, it's intended to be immersive, it's intended to give you a sense of an experience uh, which uh, I have presumed to recreate in the exhibition. Um, and it is a presumption on my part, uh, but I think it's, uh, I would stand and say it's uh, effective and it brings viewers a little closer to understanding uh, lived Buddhism of the early period. Um, the, uh, and, th and that goes for much of the other material as well on the way and manner in which it's displayed. But uh, as in all things, I'd come back to the, the statement I perhaps made at the beginning, which is the exhibition is uh, um, a foil uh, for a set of ideas, uh, trying to reposition some of the way we read some of early Buddhism and using the southern uh, tradition as the vehicle for that. That's an arbitrary choice, uh, but it brings foregrounds, uh, remarkable objects, many of which are not familiar to most people. Um, and um, I'm hoping, as I said earlier, we'll uh, add to the canon of Great Buddhist Art as we, as we know it and mm -hmm. define it. Uh, these objects, some of these objects will find their way into the standard textbooks of the day. Uh, they'll have, of course, need to consult uh, the book we produced <laughs> as the standard reference of the day as well. Um, uh, that book I had simultaneously published in India, um, uh, so it was released uh, in a very handsome edition um, and is widely available in India now mm -hmm. at roughly half the retail price of the mm -hmm. book here. Um, and that was very important to me that that happened um, and um, uh, we had my own contacts to facilitate that. Uh, so, what else do we talk about? Um, oh, the, 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 the celestial musicians. Mm -hmm. The celestial musicians, or the, uh, the celestial musicians. Oh, celestial musicians. Well, yes. I mean, um, that's. Um, but, but, but you can choose other. Um, the, 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 the wondrous things, but I mean, uh, I think it's the celebratory, uh, performative aspect mm -hmm. of early Buddhism, which is there in the visual record, if you choose to look for it. Um, um, doesn't get discussed enough, and I, I think uh, this is a way in which um, uh, we're able to foreground that, um, and um, together with the use of um, a, a, a recitation of sutras uh, recorded and piped into the exhibition space, mm -hmm. uh, not through the it's not through the entire exhibition; it's confined mm -hmm. to the relic chamber uh, space itself uh, to a large degree. Um, uh, so it's something you come upon, uh, and you're surprised. Uh, and um, yeah. uh, you get a sense of, of what it's about. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And historical geography? Yes. Uh, um, yeah. uh, the, yes, I mean, um, I think it's very clear if we're looking at the uh, earliest Buddhist art from Andhra Dessa, uh, that we have a very clear uh, stylistic unity emerging, um, which is not so well, uh, has been, I think, effectively studied. Um, and I think this, this door op exhibition opens up the possibility of doing that. Uh, the mobility of objects within the Buddhist mm -hmm. diaspora is very important. Uh, not only the relics themselves, but the reliquies. Um, and no doubt both traveled. Uh, uh, some uh, made locally, but others I'm sure would circulate. Uh, from Sanati, for example, we have an example of a Moyan ringstone, uh, not well known, um, excavated. Mm -hmm. uh, um, in the 1970s, uh, and uh, way off, way off territory. I mean, these belong in Taxila and uh, a north and northwestern belt. Um, we've also got them for the first time in in Insula, Southeast Asia. Moyan, mm. Shungan ringstones and disc stones, uh, which I publish in the catalogue. Um, and uh, this is extending the our whole understanding uh, of the dispersal and reach of Satavahana culture as well, both the Moyan and Shungan in the north and the Satavahana in the south. Those gold earrings I didn't talk about, uh, there was a second pair in the same image on mm. the screen. They came out of a riverbed in Southeast Asia. 
Huh. And same granulation technique, ultimately from the Greek Macedonian world, no question. Um, and uh, the, the, these are the first examples. Mm -hmm. We always thought the pair we had in the Met were unique, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the, the literal, the, 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 the much abused word. Um, and indeed, they are. They, they are. Uh, but now two half size, crushed, but nonetheless absolutely the same family mm -hmm. uh, coming out of a riverine site uh, in, in uh, uh, Peninsula Thailand. Uh, clear proof uh, of the reach of the Satavahana culture across the Bay of Bengal uh, in around the first century. Mm -hmm. We've got the archaeological evidence is growing and growing and uh, that is, I brought all of that, much of that together in the, in the publication, mm -hmm. um, uh, which I would <coughs> I was going to bring and show you, but I forgot. So, <laughs> so you have to just come buy your own copy, won't you? Um, it's a, it's a steal. It's a steal. Well, thank you so much um, for this amazing talk and your uh, really insightful comments. And I'm sure hopefully we'll have a little more time. I just want to kind of make sure that we have time for some questions. So, mm -hmm. thank you. We have one question right here. Uh, she's been yes, staring I so much, at me. To <laughs> I so much enjoyed this talk as, as an amateur. Um, and I haven't yet been to the exhibition, but I look forward to going very soon. And I have two questions, um, both of which I think will be intriguing to other people as well. Um, you mentioned how polychrome rarely lasts, how paint doesn't last. Um, and mm -hmm. color fades away. And of course, in the light of what the Met has got in, in a, exhibiting you know, classical Greek sculptures mm -hmm. and their vivid coloration, I would love to hear what you think about whether these objects were originally brightly painted or right. painted at all, and what can we know about that, because that will certainly affect our sure. our experience okay. of them. And my second question is, um, when you were showing us the reliquaries, you pointed to one in particular and said, for this one, there is a plausible case that it actually contains relics of the Buddha. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you I, I got the impression that you were discussing bodily parts of some kind but it wasn't Absolutely. clear to me. So maybe you could say a little more okay. about that. Okay, I, mean, I could also share my article with you on that if you wish. Um, the polychrome question, um, it's not so much the colors fade away, they wash away. The power of the monsoon is so, so strong that the pigments and then the uh, lime plaster ground on which they're painted on the stone surface simply wash away um, and uh, would have to have been renewed on a fairly regular basis when those sites were maintained. With the wonder of Kandalahali discovery, uh, when many of those slabs were excavated, uh, having collapsed uh, relatively early in their, uh, the life of the structure, I think. It probably only stood uh, the last phase of uh, uh, expansion, probably only, uh, it's got so little weathering, it can't have been up, uh, stood for more than a couple of hundred years before it collapsed. Uh, and in the areas where one slab, the, the construction techniques involve one slab over keying into the next one and overlapping it. There's a, a sort of su a stepping process which provides a, a locking, locking system that provides mm -hmm. stability to the drum slabs. In those mm -hmm. recesses which were protected, uh, plaster work with color um, uh, when was, was visible when these slabs were first exposed. When I first went to the site um, about 10 years ago, um, the, this was very clearly visible. I took photographs. Um, much of that has since disappeared, just in that short time of exposure. Um, mm -hmm. So um, it's a transitory and fragile thing, um, and it's dependent on maintenance, uh, constantly renewing, just as the Gopurams of South India you know, lavishly repainted on a regular basis. Um, the, the, the reliquary you refer, uh, referred to is the Pipraha reliquary, uh, excavated in 1898, um, which indeed contains an inscription which was read by Buller and uh, Street and all whole string of uh, Indologists in the late 19th century, and published, I think, three times within one year of its discovery. That's how important it was. Um, and um, uh, identifies the, contain, uh, the contents as including the corporeal remains of the Buddha, and though there was, there was bone and ash mat matter in these 
five reliquies that I showed you. Uh, that material, this is a bit of a long story, and I'll give the totally abridged version. Uh, within one year, um, that material had been um, petitioned for uh, by a Thai monk uh, uh, who was traveling in the sites, coincidentally, uh, uh, doing the pilgrim circuit, as it were. Uh, but he, he, was, he was an exceptional Thai monk, and he was first cousin to Rama V of Thailand. Uh, that's King Chuladongkorn. And uh, he had been educated in London and served as the principal uh, ambas Thai ambas Siamese ambassador to the courts of Europe in the 1880s and 1890s. Fell out of favour over constitutional reform. Um, and, and like all, when you fall out of favour with an absolute monarch, it's best to join the monastery uh, mm -hmm. for safety. Um, he petitioned for these relics, I think hoping to get back into favour with his cousin, uh, these relics be passed that they should only be in the possession of the last living Buddhist king who happened to be the king of Thailand. The British had already done away with Burma and with Sri Lanka. There were none others left. Uh, and uh, within one year, the colonial government had agreed and those relics were sent to Bangkok. Rama V, this is Rama, King and I King, Chulalongkorn. Uh, within one year, he had then uh, subdivided them into three parts. Uh, one was, uh, to be, is not seen, but it's today in a stupa in Bangkok at Constitution Square. The second is in the Shwedagon in Rangoon. The third portion went to Sri Lanka. In other words, Rama V acted exactly the same way that Ashoka did, 3rd century BC. So he was uh, being a good Dharma king. Help with yeah. it. Can you speak up? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. One of the things I wanted to know was about um, the intriguing 100 year or more lag in the South uh, in terms of the um, transition from so called an iconic to iconic depictions of the Buddha. Um, and I wondered, since there was so much travel and expansion and trade. Uh, it, what, what can we say about why the Buddha was revealed, as he put it in the last room, 100 years or more later in the South than he was in the North? So I was just interested in that. I mean, why, why isn't he there earlier in the exhibition? Is that your no, point? Well, or? It, it says in the exhibition that in the South of Ahadi Empire, uh, the art tradition, the Buddha doesn't um, become iconic until third century, whereas it's slightly earlier in the north. That's sure, yeah. I mean, it's a little earlier in the north, but in the south it's around third century. Um, no, the exhibition has been challenging for a lot of people who, you know, walk in knowing quite a lot about Buddhism because of the uh, pronounced absence of Buddhas. And there aren't very many Buddhas in the show, in fact. Uh, but it's how we arrived at the point where there is the fully revealed iconic representation in human form. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the climax of the show, not the beginning of the show. And it's a journey which I've tried to construct uh, uh, to take it through uh, the, 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 the ver early visual language in which the Buddha is only there in an uh, auspicious symbol form. I, I guess I was wondering about historically, do we know why? So, yes. yeah. so yeah, why, why did it take a hundred years more for the Buddha to become uh, iconic in the South? And As the opposed to the North? Yes. Oh, that's, that's, a, that's a, a question which partly hangs on how much you trust the chronologies and the <laughs> dating. <laughs> uh, there's a little bit of muddy water there. Um, but uh, putting that to one side, um, yes, I mean, um, I think it's an indication. That we can only speculate uh, 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 that the South was already, as it is today, uh, stridently autonomous. Um, uh, went its own way, um, didn't listen to the North much. Uh, the, the, the elements of that perhaps are coming into play. But it might be, there might be more serious reasons uh, to do with uh, the theology uh, and the particular schools of Buddhism that are being practiced and their attitudes. And the, the truth is, to the best of my understanding, is we, we essentially do not understand uh, what triggered the movement from an iconic to iconic. Um, uh, much has been written on this, uh, but it, it remains in, in the field of theory. 
um, and um, I have my tuppence worth of my opinion, um, <laughs> but it's no better than anybody else, you know, uh, uh, than, than, than anybody else's. Uh, and that that is that it's um, uh, to uh, it really grows out of uh, the uh, this emerging rise of Hinduism um, and a perceived uh, competitive landscape uh, in which Buddhism had to make itself altogether more an easier journey for the devotee um, and um, the, 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 the cerebral stuff that it seemed preoccupied with. Um, that's as good as I can get, um, that I'd love to hear other views on that. Yeah. Kind of a 30 second, just a very brief follow up. Uh, one of the, as, as you note, actually, just thinking through the, the layout of the exhibition and the culmination in the Buddha icon, in the, in the paucity of Buddhist Buddha images, I think also reframes the landscape of early Buddhism as a landscape of imagery that is not, you know, that that is far more important than the icon of the Buddha, which then begins to dominate research. It also disrupts the teleology of uh, of, of of trying to trace the way in which imagery eventually led to the inevitable invention of this of this way of, of producing. So I think that there's a that I think that the way in which you've organized the exhibition has that kind of disruptive, a productively disruptive effect, perhaps. Good. Yeah. Good. So I think Jack had a hand. Jack. I have not yet been <laughs> to the city exhibit. <laughs> and it's, it's just, yeah. so the first thing to say on the part of someone who is said to live in New York but hasn't been to see the exhibit is not just shame on me, but thanks to you. I mean, it's such a privilege to live in New York and to know that at some point, like this weekend, I can go across town and see what you and so many colleagues have done. It is just astonishing. Mm -hmm. So I'm just repeating what I think what Tamara you said about being there mm -hmm. and Rachel. I just what to say. And then there are just all sorts of questions that come to mind that I hope some of which will be answered when I'm there. One one uh, obvious one, it has to do with the role of merchants and monks in the spreading of the tradition. And I'm wondering uh, how or to what extent those monks and merchants show up in the exhibit itself, itself. Or are they somehow missing and being represented by other figures that are? So that would be one. Second, I had no idea about this motif, this sort of wrapping of the stupa in Nagas. Uh, <laughs> How did I miss that all these years? <laughs> it's amazing. Oh, that's, uh, and it really does seem like the wrapping of a reliquary, let us say. And, you know, it's, it's a gift that you would give. You might well wrap it. I mean, wow, part the what an amazing thing. Well, Jack, I, I labored long and hard over the title. You know, it was this too Old Testament, you know, um, uh, will people get it or not get it? Um, and, uh, but it was a risk. A strategy, uh, a risky strategy to capture people's interest, but to draw attention to these two key motifs, which are the, you know, light motifs of, a, of southern Buddhism, essentially, uh, the tree and the and the, and the naga, um, and um, uh, the, the more uh, I went along that journey, the more confident I got that this was the right choice, um, and um, so it's. Um, I just uh, should also just mention before it slips my mind um, that we have a two-day symposium uh, the very last weekend of this month, 16 international speakers, Greg Chopin giving the keynote, Vincent Tournier, Arlo Griffith, Peter Skilling, you name them, they're there. Um, we've drawn people from everywhere. Uh, many of those people have contributed uh, short essays to my catalogue as well, um, and uh, including Greg who was the last to be asked and the first to deliver. <laughs> um, and um, uh, so um, uh, uh, that, that should, uh, put that in your diaries. It's free, unticketed, just show up. And bring your students, please. Can I say just one thing about that? Uh, Caroline Biden is a dear friend. And you know, she lives just a few blocks from here. So every time you've said something about relics, uh, <laughs> I can report that Caroline, who's his field is, uh, you know, the medieval wrenches of, of Christianity. She's dying to go over, and she's going to. It's one of the amazing things about New York is that you also have a Caroline Bynum sitting here. 
So, you know, sure. there are all of yeah. those luminaries, and then who knows might walk, who might walk in. So I have another snake question. Um, <laughs> I was uh, really intrigued. I think you see, um, you know, you showed uh, obviously from the title and then you showed several of these wonderful images of, you know, these. Uh, there was the one of the two snake kings, I think, uh, worshiping the Buddha, is it? And then there are also these kinds of five-headed snakes with the sort of infinity sort of uh, design. Uh, I'm wondering uh, if you could say a little bit. And this is really a question to make. Um, a little bit about where these are located in situ. I'm thinking of like textual references to snake kings. And so in the Pali Canon, for instance, there's this reference to these four clans of snake kings. And then it appears again in the Melissa Rustikala, you know, separated far away in time and place. Um, so I was wondering, are these kind of peripheral elements? If I'm thinking, if I remember correctly, there are some at Sanchi. Uh, but they're kind of, they, you know, if the top billing on the Thoranas goes to the Buddha and the Jatakas, these are kind of ancillary. <coughs> Uh, are they more like Dwarapadas? Uh, you know, where do we see these kinds of snake figures uh, kind of lo located if we have, you know, a pattern? Just so, so the question is like, uh, so when you have uh, images of Naga Raja, the, the snake kings, where do you find them located architecturally within the context of, of okay, these buildings? Okay, thank you. So my, my yeah. hearing's uh, yeah. shot to pieces. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, the, 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 the strategic placement of, of these images is obviously important, um, and um, Nagas, have, of course, uh, maintained a, a, a role throughout all Indian imagery uh, as a, a protective presence, uh, be it for a, a linga or whatever. Um, but, uh, in the context of, of this, of the early Buddhist material, um, the um, it's specifically uh, they're specifically associated uh, with the Ramagrama uh, stupa, the eighth portion of the relics, and the stories that, there are multiple stories that surround that. Uh, and, um, um, uh, but uh, they, they take on another, uh, a much wider, wider life, um, uh, as uh, it extends beyond that specific narrative, um, uh, to be general uh, guardians of the Buddha's presence in whatever form that might take. Um, and uh, I mean, there are many questions that, uh, that, that, that uh, uh, touched on um, in, in, in the catalogue, uh, which we have no immediate answers. Um, I mean, uh, the, how we read the, 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 the symbolic the, uh, and iconic representations of the Buddha and the presence of the relics. Um, some of the inscriptions seem to suggest very clearly that the Buddha is uh, made present by the relics. Uh, that he is actually there as opposed to being a memorial, uh, a memory of something since lost. Um, and um, uh, uh, this came out very clearly in the uh, virtual, we did a 15 minute virtual tour of the exhibition, uh, which you can now see on YouTube, uh, introduced by our director. Uh, and I invited Don Lopez to come in as a second voice. Um, and uh, it was quite clear that Don and I had a different take on this. <laughs> Uh, which became slightly awkward on camera, uh, but we, we managed to nav navigate our differences, I think. Um, but uh, but uh, for my, to my, my, the way, from my reading, and certainly from the translations of the various inscriptions I've, I've been looking at, uh, and uh, that, that, uh, that they're very much talking about uh, uh, the, the, the relics being invigorated you know, by the presence of the Buddha, that these are um, living, li living presences, um, and uh, it's not just the, you know, the recorded word, the Dharma written down. It's not just the memory, uh, some some memorial uh, item that is far more more tangible and and uh, 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 full of life uh, than that. Um, and uh, so I think that that's to, uh, a lot of what the efficacy of relics is about. And then okay. Let's do it quick. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, actually, I I had the good fortune to visit the exhibit today with Don Lopez and of the, <laughs> the live version of, of the, his contribution to the audio group. Um, but yes, I was um, I, one of the things I was wondering about. Uh, you mentioned at the start, and you had monasteries in, in the title of your talk, and you talked about how monastic archaeology is skewed in favor of stupas. Um, mm -hmm. and I, I was, there was a kind of, it felt like a noticeable absence of monastic, monasticism 
in a lot of the, uh, the um, pieces that were part of the exhibition. Um, and I'm, uh, you know, I was just wondering if you could maybe fill in the monastic elements in, that are in the in the part of the landscape there that maybe aren't evident or coming through in the exhibition. Are you getting this? Um, and then I, I also just had a, 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 another quick question about the. Uh, so I was struck by how some of the the very earliest uh, iconographic images of the Buddha uh, look like you know what familiar. Um, uh, portrayals of Nagarjuna with the you know the serpent uh, coming over over his head, um, and yet this comes you know uh, appears after Nagarjuna lived. So I was curious about you know maybe uh, if there there's some if you could share something about the history of the development of that of Nagarjuna's iconography and its relation to these really early images of the, the Buddha in this uh, area. So, so uh, do, uh, do you want to sort of? Read that really so the first part had to do with like filling in the gaps with some of the the um, ways in which monasticism is or is not present in the exhibition, and then the second part had to do with the Naga. Nagarjuna, Nagarjuna, Nagarjuna and the early imagery, the, the, these early uh, iconographic images. Of the Buddha were we first see the Buddha, and we then you know yeah. the images with the serpents, with the serpent hoods. Yeah. So, uh, so is it kind of like the connection between those two types of images, yeah. the images of Nagas and the image of the Buddha, where you see those two? And, yeah. yeah, at Nagarjuna Kunda and other places, and and what is that connection? And the figure Nagarjuna yeah. Later gets portrayed in right. Okay, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, that's a about good that. question. Great question, uh, actually. Yeah. So I mean, trying to get a sense of what uh, early monasticism was like is is. is uh, uh, clearly a risky strategy uh, and uh, uh, all we can attempt to do is uh, uh, use the visual visual evidence uh, and uh, we have a you know through Chopin's work for example in a very clear uh, uh, well his particular take uh, on, on, on uh, the dynamics of a, of a monastic life um, and, uh, 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 and it's uh, all the sort of the rough edges of monasticism, uh, and the, the whole issues of dealing with money and property and so on, um, and uh, the ability of, of, uh, of, the, of the, the Buddha's presence, uh, the Buddha to own property, uh, the stupa to have a legal entity, uh, be a legal entity in its own right. Mm -hmm. um, all, of, all of those sort of windows have really been opened by Chopin's work and his readings uh, that he, he's offered to us. Uh, and that certainly influenced my thinking to considerable considerable extent um, and um, beyond that um, uh, yes I mean we um, uh, we can't begin to reconstruct um, I mean and in, in, in so many cases particularly in the south um, is, uh, uh, that uh, the monastic presence is uh, barely recorded or, or barely um, uh, barely investigated I touched at the beginning of talked about stupa archaeology this sort of almost fetish with focusing on the stupa and ignoring the wider uh, landscape in which it is situated and how it relates to the monastic community and beyond that the lay community. Um, those interactions um, um, we are only just beginning to look at and uh, the archaeology is starting to happen but, but it's, uh, it's compromised in so many ways by um, urban expansion and you know, the accessibility to sites and so on um, so it will never be uh, complete. Uh, so that, 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 that's uh, uh, it's, it's a very limited thing. Um, but uh, I thought it was time that an exhibition did more than just present beautiful Buddhas, um, the A to Z of Buddhism. Uh, that is an attempt to um, uh, focus on one particular region, to dig into the origins of image making in that context, um, and to see where that journey took us. Um, and the exhibition is the, is, the ans is the result of that inquiry. I think, I think on a pragmatic level too, just thinking about objects in a museum context, so much of the sculptural imagery that we see comes from stupa sites and rather than from monastic context. So in some ways, actually, perhaps the paintings of the ceilings, the copy of the paintings of the ceilings from Ajanta is one way in which you get the monastic sure, yeah. context. Yes, well, I, 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 but it's, yeah. yeah. Okay. So. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.